Welcome to TNT Unpacked's Mental Health Series. I'm your host, Justin Collymore, and I'm here with Dr. James Bratt, who's actually been in the studio already, talking Hi. about mental health. Hello, good night. Um, in case you're wondering where Rochelle is, she's off doing more important things, so she <laughs> couldn't join us. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're talking about Alzheimer's, and September is actually World Alzheimer's Month. Yep, it is. Um, it's something that's celebrated every year around the world and um, we do too in Trinidad and Tobago and there's a whole bunch of activities that are being organized by the Alzheimer's Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Starting off on September 3rd, a Thanksgiving sort of service at um, the Port of Spain office which is right. in Lower St. James in Nepal Street. Following week on the 10th of September, um, there's a memory cafe in Bonacord right. in Arima. And that's a, a day of activities for mm. people with dementia to go get out and, you know, socialize and lime and just do fun things for a day. Following week, there's a seminar in Diamondville, which I'll be talking at. And then the week after that, there's an information desk at Nalis in both Port of Spain and in um, Tobago. There's a movie night as well at Nalis. Mm -hmm. And finally, there's going to be an event in Tobago. So lots and lots of different mm -hmm. choices depending on where you live in. Nice. So let's unpack Alzheimer's for a minute. So okay. why is it important for people to know about Alzheimer's and to understand it? Okay. Well, let me just start off by saying what it is. Right. And actually the most common question that I get asked as a geriatric psychiatrist is what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people kind of not sure what they are and what's the difference. Well, actually, dementia is the umbrella term. So mm -hmm. um, there are many different types of dementias and Alzheimer's is the most common one. So about two thirds of all dementias, 60 to 70 percent are Alzheimer's. And then the second most common type is called vascular dementia. Mm -hmm. And that um, has to do with circulation issues in your brain. So two totally different processes. Um, and then there are quite a few other types of dementias. Right. Dementia is a progressive neurological disease. So what does that mean? Progressive means that it gets worse over time. Yeah. And so there's no cure. We do have medications that can control it or slow it down, but um, we can't stop it or reverse it. And what does neurological mean? That means that it's affecting your brain function. Right. So a lot of people um, think it's only a memory problem, but memory loss is an essential part of the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, but it's certainly not the only symptom. Mm -hmm. um, so it's affecting any part of your brain and it's affecting many, many different functions of your brain. Right. So um, you can have difficulties with day-to-day -day tasks and you can um, have hallucinations and paranoia. You can have aggression or violence. Mm -hmm. You can have personality change. Um, you know, each person is yeah. different. And is it essentially a result of just your body deteriorating, your brain deteriorating? Um, we are not 100% sure mm -hmm. what causes it. So there are some types that are more strongly genetically linked. So, for mm -hmm. example, something called early onset Alzheimer's dementia which means um, that when you develop it earlier than 60 years of age, mm -hmm. um, that's quite um, strongly linked genetically. So if you have that in your family, you're more at risk of getting it. But the common type of Alzheimer's, late onset Alzheimer's, typically we see it starting in, the se in your 70s or 80s. And we're, we're not sure um, why it happens. Um, so to answer your question, it's, it's not part of normal aging. It mm -hmm. is a disease. Ah, okay, so right. in normal aging, yes, our body's kind of, you know, don't work so well after many years <laughs> yeah. of wear and tear mm -hmm. and we have to ex expect that but dementia is a, a disease right. it's abnormal mm. what is the sort of goal mm. of having a month dedicated to alzheimer's well the goal is to raise awareness and to educate right um and, and to reduce stigma mm -hmm. Um, so I also represent an organization called Age Caribbean, mm. uh, myself and my colleague Rochelle Amor, who's a gerontologist, gerontology being the study of aging, um, focusing more on social aspects of aging rather than medical aspects. We are going to be supporting the Alzheimer's Association in doing just that. Right. And why do we want to educate and support and, and raise awareness and reduce stigma? Because the more that we know that the earlier people are treated mm -hmm. and the more that families are supported, the better people's quality of life is going to be. Right. The, and the person themselves with dementia is going to have a much, much better life mm -hmm. in the end. So in your practice, have you um, experienced people maybe not seeking help soon enough? Yeah, that's very common. Sometimes uh, you know, there are different stages of dementia, mm -hmm. um, early, middle and late being the most common way that we um, separate it out. And sometimes I will have um, people presenting in the late stage. Mm -hmm. um, and by then the family has struggled 
along for a long time on their own, mm -hmm. um, sometimes with help from other doctors, sometimes not. As I've been back to Trinidad for the last two years, I've been trying to um, raise awareness and write articles and speak at uh, different functions. I am getting people coming very early saying, right. you know, oh, we read your article and we, we just want to check, yeah. which is great. You know, mm -hmm. and sometimes I'll, I'll check them and um, they're absolutely fine. And I reassure them and I say, don't worry, this is normal aging. Yeah. <laughs> um, don't panic. And then sometimes I'll send them for more tests. Right, right, right. And sometimes give the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So how do you test for uh, dementia? Okay, so there are three standard tests and they're standard all over the world. So apart from taking a full medical history and what we call a mental state examination, which is the equivalent of a physical examination that your, let's say your general practitioner would do, um, then the test that we do would be a brain scan. Mm -hmm. And the gold standard is an MRI brain scan, simply because it shows up so much more detail than a CT or CAT scan. Um, if you can't have an MRI, then it's okay to have a CT scan. But if you have the choice and you can afford it, mm -hmm. then you should always go for an MRI. And then I will generally get blood tests unless they've been done already, just checking for any other causes. Really, we, there are reversible dementias. For example, um, low thyroid function, hypothyroidism mm -hmm. can, in rare circumstances, give you a dementia-like picture. So we want to yeah. rule out anything that we can do something about. Mm -hmm. And also looking at the person's physical health like their cholesterol and their blood sugar. All of those things are very, very important, especially for vascular dementia. Right. Um, and then the last test is something called cognitive, um, a cognitive assessment. And that is a standardized assessment um, that we use to, to test different parts of a person's brain function. So we'll mm -hmm. do a memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, reading, writing, drawing, calculation, um, naming, verbal fluency. We'll go through a whole host of different um, tests to have an objective view on how mm -hmm. your brain is doing. So you mentioned that there's no cure. When you go through these tests with a patient and you find that, yes, this person has Alzheimer's, how do you begin, like, what's the sort of process or journey that that person goes through in your practice or in any practice, really? Okay, so if it's somebody who um, who is brand new to the whole thing and they're not quite sure, I spend the first session asking many, many questions mm -hmm. um, to take the, the full history I and mean, it's important to take a really long time doing that and to do it slowly and thoroughly mm -hmm. um, because every every piece of information that you get in your history is vital, even down to things like, you know, a person's alcohol intake or whether they smoke or have smoked for many years or are they dieting, or what their diet is like or are they exercising. Those things are all, all very important. Mm -hmm. um, so it takes quite a long time, an hour to an hour and a half typically. Um, so how long it takes me and then I decide on on, on the tests that need to be done mm -hmm. and then I'll bring them back for more testing, the cognitive testing and then I try to spend some time after giving the diagnosis to explain more about it and to reassure them and I give lots of written information because mm -hmm. I know that people, you know, have to digest it a little bit and yeah. then they might want to read about things later give give them the websites that they can go to to read more stuff and then i have a, a once monthly free support group in my office right. um, and the alzheimer's association has one as well mm -hmm. um in four different locations in trinidad in port of spain arima san fernando and tobago and mm -hmm. then i have mine in my office and that's a chance for people who have been diagnosed or for family or friends to come and learn more about it because it's a journey yeah you can't learn about something so complex mm -hmm. in two visits and so I have that there on the um, last Saturday of every month. So I just actually had, had it yesterday okay. in my office. Yeah, I have a good turnout usually. Um, and I think people find it valuable and I show videos and mm -hmm. um, we discuss different problems that arise because it's definitely something that's different for each person is completely different. Um, and so people have different problems and um, you know, it's good to have that support network. Yeah, I think it's good. You know, it, you kind of get that sense of community and yeah. togetherness and other people have this problem yeah, and you're it not gives alone. them strength. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's also a book that a, a lady called Pat DeCosta wrote recently. She's a lady from Pitti Valley um, and she wrote about her experiences with both her parents who had dementia. Mm -hmm. It gives you a, a really real outlook of what it can be like, but I always tell people um, not every case is like that. It was yeah. quite a severe case she was dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there definitely are a lot of people out there in Trinidad and Tobago who are dealing with this on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And um, the cost to the, f to the person, the cost both financially and emotionally to the person with dementia, to their family and to the economy, 
in other countries they've done um, health economic studies that have shown that the cost of dementia to the country is yeah. in the millions and millions of pounds or dollars mm. whatever country you're talking yeah, about yeah. As we're on that topic, what are some of the local resources that are available to people suffering with this or the families of people? In Trinidad and Tobago, there's public and private. Mm -hmm. Um, So there is a memory clinic at Mount Hope run out of the psychiatry department. The public um, clinics need a referral from Mm -hmm. a doctor. Um, And sometimes I send my patients to the public clinic because maybe they live in the east and maybe they can't afford private or maybe it's just so difficult for them to come to see me in Port of Spain. They can see a doctor in Mount Hope. So there's the Mount Hope Clinic, there's a San Fernando Memory Clinic, we call them Memory Clinics. Yeah. Um, and as far as I know, there's one in Scarborough. So what, ha- what happens at a memory clinic? Same exact thing, what I do. Okay. Uh, lots of questions, <laughs> <laughs> right. and then tests, and mm. then diagnosis and treatment. And you can get the medications for free through the public system. Mm-hmm. However, supply yeah, is not always consistent. Right. A lot of times people will end up having to buy the medication, which can be very expensive. Mm-hmm. But I do try to encourage people to get it for free yeah, yeah. through <laughs> some of the health centers as well, like Woodbrook Health Center, I heard mm-hmm. um, they have sometimes. So I do try to get people to save money that way. Right. And then there are private doctors like myself. Um, well, I'm the only geriatric psychiatrist. Um, you can also see a neurologist. Right. Or you could see a GP who is very confident and, and has had extra training in this field. Mm. But a neurologist would essentially take a similar approach in asking questions and, and that type of thing. Yeah, I think um, maybe in psychiatry, our approach is more, more focuses a lot on the social aspects. Right. Um, so I actually do a lot of home visits. And when you see a person in their environment, you gain a lot more knowledge about mm. what their day-to-day situation is. Yeah. Whereas most doctors don't do home visits mm-hmm. apart from GPs. I think that we look at the whole picture in psychiatry. So we look at the medical aspect, but also the psychological and the social. I think we're probably more touchy-feely. You know, mm. we, 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 we care about, you know, the stress that the family are going under. And, yeah, and, you're and, taking the emotional aspect yeah, of it. And I mean, I, I sometimes think that the patient turns out to be the family because, you know, if people are coming into my office and they're crying and they're stressed out and they can't work and they can't sleep and they're going to have a nervous breakdown, if I don't help them, mm-hmm. then they are not going to be able to take care of their loved one. So mm-hmm. it's important to look at the whole picture. Yeah, I think sometimes we forget how challenging it is on the family members who are responsible yeah. for this person. And maybe they have kids as well mm-hmm. yeah. that they're looking after. Mm-hmm. And it can be very, very challenging. One thing I'm curious um, with respect to dementia, Alzheimer's and mental health in general is comparing scenarios where a person gets help versus where a person doesn't get help. If one person doesn't get help, how does that outcome differ? It really depends on how the person with dementia presents. So for example, um, one of my relatives had Alzheimer's. She probably from the time of diagnosis until the time she died, it was probably, you know, between 10 and 15 years. Mm -hmm. It can be that long. Yeah. And she was always quite a placid person and she remained a placid person. In fact, she became more placid to the point where she wasn't (laughs) even talking anymore. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, that was an easier case to deal with as opposed to somebody who is screaming all night Mm -hmm. or throwing things or biting or kicking or attacking people. If you don't have help in those cases, it's going to be much, Mm -hmm. much worse where as if your family member is very placid, you're going to have it easier. But it also depends on your personality. Mm. Some people can handle it really well. Right. Um, and some people will educate themselves and will read up on the internet and then some people don't. Another thing that I could talk about mm. is risk. Yeah. In psychiatry, we always assess risk with any of our patients um, because there's always the risk of suicide right. or homicide mm-hmm. or simply self-neglect. So in vulnerable people, in vulnerable adults and people with dementia are vulnerable, we look at all the risks. So there are risks associated with memory loss. So for example, leaving the stove on. Yeah pots catching on fire or one of my patients they they left the iron on and the whole curtain and mattress caught on fire Um, or leaving the taps running I've had people who have had bad floods that Mm -hmm. cause a lot of damage or leaving the front door open kind of thing then some people might wander off and get lost that's pretty scary we have a lot of people who probably should not be driving on our (laughs) roads (laughs) And, uh, Both young people and old people, yeah. let's be real. Yeah. O- over, yeah. Yeah, the, over the entire population. Yeah. But we have no system in place where I can refer patients for a driving assessment. Because right. if you have concerns about somebody's driving, then you need to demonstrate whether they're safe or yeah. not. So that's tricky. But also just, you know, forgetting to eat or not really caring or, you mm-hmm. know, about bathing or dressing or personal hygiene. Those can pose risks. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but sometimes also people can become violent. And so yeah. last week I had a patient who became extremely paranoid and angry mm -hmm. when the family put a caregiver in for the first time. Right. And she ran the caregiver down with big on wow. and was spraying her in her face <laughs> oh and my God. belted a, a basin and, a, um, and was attacking her with an yeah. umbrella. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we always have to think about that. And one of the big, big ones as well that I come across is, is fraud, financial abuse and uh, Sadly, it's a lot of family members who are stealing from their elderly relatives, whether that is that they, they go to the teller with them and they tell granny, just sit down and decide, granny, mm -hmm. I'll do it. And then they take out $10,000 in yeah, one go. Yeah. Or just, you know, taking their pension money or, you know, a variety of different things. So some of the banks are actually very aware of this. And um, actually just last week, I wrote a, a letter to one of the Republic Bank branches to say, you know, I have concerns about this lady. Could you please put a warning on her account? Mm -hmm. And Republic Bank is one of the banks that seems to be more proactive. Pro yeah, about, progressive in that way. Yeah, yeah, and sort of thinking about protecting elderly clients. Yeah, because yeah, I know a lot of times when I think about Alzheimer's, the very basic idea we get in my head is, okay, well, this is a person who forgets who I am or just forgets who they are. Yeah. But as you just explained, there's so many different avenues and yeah. so many different risks and dangers that need to be taken yeah. into consideration. So these are the types of things that would then be highlighted through World Alzheimer's Month. Exactly, exactly. Because the more information that people acquire, the more they will be able to better, to mm -hmm. better handle situations and, right. and deal with it. Mm -hmm. I've heard from a lot of my patients that some doctors will say, well, the medication does nothing, which I completely disagree with based on the multitude of studies that have been done yeah. around the world that have shown that it does slow down the progression and mm -hmm. also people do much better when they're on the medications yeah. from early on and consistently because if you stop it, you can see a very fast deterioration. Right. So, yeah, how does how does the medication work exactly? I don't want to get too technical. Yeah, um, <laughs> but essentially, um, there is something called a neurotransmitter, right. and a neurotransmitter is um, how the signals are transmitted from one nerve to the other. And mm -hmm. there's one called acetylcholine, mm -hmm. and there's an enzyme that normally breaks that down, mm -hmm. and so we the medicine stops that enzyme from breaking it down. Right thereby increasing the, the levels of acetylcholine. So they're called acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the theory is that we have more acetylcholine and so more messages can be right. transmitted. Okay. Some people will say that they notice absolutely no difference mm -hmm. even after a couple of months. And some people will come back to me and say, wow, I notice a big difference. Yeah. The other thing that has been shown in a big study last year in Finland, it was shown... Um, that activities are really important. Mentally stimulating activities mm -hmm. yeah. and physical exercise are very important in slowing it down. Mm -hmm. So they followed up, you know, thousands of patients in Finland. Some people were not given any of the interventions and some were, you know, had a, a gym person working with them or physiotherapist yeah. and a dietitian and, you know, an activities coordinator and did a very intensive program. And it was shown that those people did much, much better. Mm -hmm. So the concept of senior centers or day centers mm -hmm. is very important. And you have a senior center. Center, Gems and, uh, Club. Actually, I, I have recently <laughs> opened up a senior center at Assumption Church in mm -hmm. Maraval called Jim's Club, me being Jim. And the reason I opened it up is because the Port of Spain Senior Center through the Ministry of People and Social Development actually unfortunately closed down in right. January 2016. But we do have 10 others around the country mm -hmm. in the east and central and south and, and, and in Tobago. But ironically, the capital city has none or had mm -hmm. none. until right. I, And I've just opened it up recently. It's still very small. And I've tried to keep the cost as low as possible yeah. um, because we're talking about pensioners. Mm -hmm. We have exercise groups. We have yoga. We have Spanish and French class. We have pottery. We mm -hmm. hopefully going to have Tai Chi. We have iPad class. Right. So eventually, hopefully, there'll be even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if you remember this, but we, in one of these psych meetings that we went to, somebody was saying that... Um, Learning, learning a musical instrument is like the most effective That was probably treatment. me saying that. Was that you, you were saying that, right? <laughs> probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they've had some specific studies uh, uh, regarding learning a musical instrument and mm -hmm. learning a foreign language. Right. And they've shown that those two things in particular um, help to develop your brain, different mm -hmm. parts of your brain, and they help to reduce the chances of dementia. So right. um, bilingual people are supposed to be less at risk than mm. monolingual people. Um, and playing a musical instrument is actually a very complicated thing, and you're using many many different parts of your brain at the same time. And we can we can show that by using something called a functional MRI. So that's a special type of MRI where they inject a dye into mm -hmm. you. And on the computer screen, it 
which, whichever part of your brain is being used will light up in right. a bright color. Mm -hmm. And when you're playing a musical instrument, you basically all the areas of your brain are wow. being used at the same time because you have to think about the song you're playing. You have to use your hands to play the song. You, you need yeah. to use your the part of, that's in charge of rhythm. You have to, you know, your coordination, mm -hmm. memory, everything. So. Yeah. This is uh, motivating me to, to, to pick up this keyboard and, yes. and start practicing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Have you been playing guitar? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I actually bought a keyboard for myself mm. um, for this reason, which <laughs> I haven't been using myself. <laughs> um, but I have been learning Mandarin. Right. And so that is the way that I'm trying to, ah, um, okay, okay. to stimulate my brain. Um, I know the last time you were here, we spoke about the dangers of some unaccredited mental health professionals in Trinidad. Because I sub-specialized, mm -hmm. um, so what I do is a very specialized thing. I think a little bit more aware of the risks um, for older people. Yeah. For example, medication. Older people, by and large, should be given half the amounts mm -hmm. of medication that younger people. That's just a kind of a rough rule. Mm -hmm. um, and I come across a lot of people who are over-medicated on psychiatric drugs. And psychiatric drugs are pretty potent drugs, and there's lots of side effects. Um, and when, when you, the, the older person is taking like six or seven other physical health yeah. meds and then you add on three or four psych meds on top of that, that it can never be good mm -hmm. for the person. And a lot of um, psychiatric drugs are sedating yeah. and that increases the risk of falls. A lot of drugs like clonazepam, which is uh, known by one of the brand names Rivetril. Other ones like Valium or Ativan or Xanax or Dormicum or Lexotan, that's an example of ones that are, are very commonly used. They're mm -hmm. sedating. They actually cause memory loss. Right. So it's, you don't really wow. want to use it <laughs> in a person with memory loss. Yeah. Um, that, are, that, you know, for a long period of time, they mm -hmm. should be only used in short periods. Right. I, I, by and large, try to use a minimum amount of medication and try to encourage more mm. healthy, natural activities like exercising yeah, yeah, yeah. or the arts mm -hmm. and music, stuff like that. Right. Do you have any advice for families out there that have a member that has Alzheimer's? I think the first step is getting a diagnosis. Right. The reason why we give people diagnoses is so that we can follow the guidelines for treatment. Yeah. And so that's the first point of call. Um, whether you go private or you go public, I think you should do it. And at least, you know, to have peace of mind that you know what you're dealing with. And then education is the key. So mm -hmm. come to the free seminars that we have or go online. Always try to read accredited websites that are reputable. So the American Alzheimer's Association, mm -hmm. the Canadian one, the UK yeah. one, Australia. You know, we, we have one in Trinidad and Tobago as well, which has all the same information as the Canadian one. Or the Mayo Clinic is another good website. Yeah. Don't read those um, fora, you know, where mm -hmm. people are giving their opinions or whatever. You know, you yeah, should yeah. Only, <laughs> only stick to the... Um, the reputable yeah. sources. Yeah. So, and again, it's a journey and mm -hmm. you will not be able to, to learn it in one go. I find that I personally... Um, learn a lot by reading. So I um, I have a book, for example, that I show people that I got on Amazon. It's a care, it's called Caregiver's Guide to Dementia, mm -hmm. um, and it's very practical and useful. And I I tell people buy buy this book or buy a similar book, mm -hmm. um, and and teach yourself yeah, all yeah. the tricks mm -hmm. of the trade. Do your research. <laughs> yeah, we think that prevention goes a long way. The reason why we doctors always go on and on about, you know, not drinking too much and not smoking and exercising, all that, because we, we're thinking about the long term effects yeah. on your body. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, when you're 20, you're not thinking about how you're going to feel when exactly. you're 60 or 70. But that's what we all have to try to do. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times, um, you know, that's a good reason why we should pay attention to something like this, you know. Yeah, you have to think about your old age, you know, whether yeah. it's financially or the, your medical care in your old age. And you have to think about if you want to remain strong and healthy, yeah. you know, you have to try to do all the right things as hard as it is exactly, to do. Exactly. It is hard for everybody. And in terms of vascular dementia as well, that's a circulation one. The same risk factors for strokes and heart attacks is the same risk factors ah, okay. for vascular dementia. So right. high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, mm -hmm. inactivity. All of those sorts of things, alcohol and smoking, um, are all risk factors. So the same thing that's good for your heart is the same thing that's good for your brain. All right, James. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Actually, one more thing came to mind. 
There are some amazing individuals called music therapists and mm -hmm. art therapists that we have in Trinidad, and those are alternate forms of helping people. Mm -hmm. um, we have lots of fantastic psychologists as well, occupational therapists, physiotherapists. So all of these types of therapies are very, very useful, but it can be very expensive right. to do all of them. Mm -hmm. But sometimes if you can afford one of them and you think that one of those is particularly needed yeah. or suited to the person, mm -hmm. we have them available. And even under the public sector, so I know St. St. Anne's Hospital has a huge stigma attached to it, but we actually do have both an art and a music therapist at St. Anne's, believe it or not. I and, didn't know that, yeah. Um, it's amazing. It actually mm. is fantastic that we have that. We don't have enough of it, but mm -hmm. we do have it. Yeah, so, we're getting there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I hope everybody checks out the activities for World Alzheimer's Month. And if you forget what I said, um, don't worry. You can call the Alzheimer's Association or check out their Facebook page. Yes. And also check out James. You know, he has Jim's Club, mm -hmm. Age Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Age Caribbean will be there too. Mm -hmm. So you can come and talk to Rochelle and I yeah. if you have any questions. And we put all the links to local resources and Jim's information in the notes. So if you want to check that out, please go right ahead. Okay. James, thank you very much again. Welcome. All right. Mm -hmm.